Hello out there. Welcome back to the show. Um, Kyle here, Steve down there, Dave is uh, producing, and the man of the hour. We are so honored to have Isaac Arthur himself here on the show. Hello, Mr. Arthur. How are you today, sir? Doing great. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Um, before we begin, uh, what we're going to talk about tonight, I uh, just want to let you guys know, following this stream, uh, I will be on the Cirrus the Skeptics channel. He's um, the the topic for the podcast that he's having is how to handle a dumpster fire. And um, apparently, I am the uh, I I'm the go to on how to uh, to handle um, dumpster fire. So if you want to check that out, uh, follow me over there. As soon as we end here, and uh, that'll be cool. Um, Steve, did you get a chance to watch that press conference yesterday that we talked about? I did watch it. Um, I can never see and unsee what I've what I saw on that. I've never been so disappointed to be an American in all my life. To be honest with you, I've never seen such an unpresidential president um, in the way he handled the situation, and that the White House is actually lying about what occurred by doctoring by promoting a doctored video about the uh, the incident with Acosta and the intern. I'm I'm just mortified to be honest with you. So yeah, thanks for making me watch that and losing what little hope yeah. I have for humanity. Humanity left. So you know. It was wild, I'll tell you. Um, I just wanted to make sure that you, you got a chance to see that. Um, so we got a lot of uh, a lot of comments, emails. Um, sometimes we th there's a, a channel in our, in our Discord server called uh, Show Suggestions. And a lot of times people will leave suggestions for shows for us to do or guests to contact. And um, never have we had a, a guest be requested so much or so enthusiastically than... Uh, Mr. Arthur himself. So it was really cool of him to take the time to uh, come on here. We're happy that he's here. And uh, any time you guys have suggestions like that, let us know. We do contact every uh, person that you suggest. Uh, sometimes they respond, sometimes they don't. But in this case, we're really happy that um, he did. So once again, thank you, uh, Isaac, for coming on. And uh, I'm going to let I'm gonna hand it over to you and just uh, introduce yourself, tell people what you do and kind of why you do it. And then we'll uh, jump into some mind uploading. Oh, well, I guess the uh, channel Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur, pretty self-explanatory. We look at topics in terms of the uh, the more distant future for the most part. We will sometimes talk about things that are only 10 or 20 years off, but for the most part, we like to look, focus deeper down in time and uh, just try to see, you know, a lot of times with a given concept or science fiction concept, uh, how much science there is behind it, how likely it is, and where we might end up zigging where we call the expected zag. And that's basically what we look at. Things like the Fermi paradox, mega structures, planetary colonization, and so on. Oh, and mind uploading. Excellent. Uh, um, so what, what, what's been the, like, uh, the, the most wild out there concept that you've covered since you've been doing YouTube? Like just completely out in left field. Probably civilizations at the end of time. It was uh, one of those episodes where you were just seeing, uh, you know, how far out could you push civilization if you really wanted to? And if you're willing to go completely digital and basically to upload your civilization onto computers, uh, could you actually have a civilization survive after all the stars had burned out? And we looked at that and we saw that not only could you potentially do, at least on paper, um, but it might actually be a much more vibrant civilization than we have now, much more populous, even though the whole universe is burned out just from some factors there that you gain in terms of it being cordial and that increasing the efficiency of computing. <clears throat> oh, that's killer. Now, how would that work with us? How would we flourish with no, um, with, with a burnt out universe? Say again, please. How would we, uh, like you said, we would flourish. How would we do that with a burnt out universe? Uh if the basic concept being that there's a point at which all the stars are burned out, they're all out of fuel, but all that mass is still there and it starts to fall into black holes. Well, if correct, and again, we've never actually had a black hole to examine, they give off just a little bit of power. Right now, they're, none of them are actually losing mass because there's so much energy ambient in the universe, they're still sucking it in. But they give off just a little bit of power, and as the universe cools and expands, there's this break-even point where they start giving off more than they bring in. And at that point, that's power source. It's a t 
tiny, tiny power source, but it's also a very cold universe. And we have something called the Landau limit that uh, is allegedly the maximum theoretical limit on calculation. And it's linearly direct, uh, connected to temperature. So as the universe gets cooler, you get much more efficient. And if it gets down to like millikelvins and things like that, suddenly you can do a million times the processing off the same amount of energy as before. And even though black holes only give off a trickle of power, they do do it for insane amounts of time at a very efficient level. So you could conceivably run a civilization ultra slow that was much more populous than even a galactic empire. Ah, that and makes how sense. How you feel about doing that is a little tricky. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I have to ask because it's something that we, it's, it's a, a subject that we kind of deal with often here. We have, and actually this weekend we have two debates that are going to be happening, but um, have you covered flat earth by chance on your, uh, on your channel? In a way we, we did discuss one time building things like outers and discs and disc worlds. And actually next month we're doing an episode on flat earth, but it's not a flat earth theory episode. It's a mega structures episode for if you wanted to build a flat planet. Um, and there's actually some reasons why you, you might do that if you're a very uh, advanced civilization. Um, we'll be looking at some of the way we do talk about the flat earth theory there just a little bit because it gives us a bit of an idea, you know, what you'd have to fix to make the planet earth like on what the differences would be. Uh, but it is not a flat earth debate, of course. I, my channel in general, most folks uh, believe the world is round. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's probably likely. We um we have a we have an interesting mix, but um, flat Earth debates is something that we're kind of uh, known for, and you would be surprised, I think, at how many people just dismiss everyday concepts that we, you know, we just think are as part of everyday life. You know, gravity. They they think that it's not gravity; it's the it's buoyancy and density, and it's just bizarre. So, I mean, as as someone like yourself. It's a, a science educator and, you know, really invested in trying to advance, you know, the knowledge of the science or, or the knowledge that people have about science. What do you think the reason for this movement is and why it's kind of gaining some traction? Do you have any any sort of thoughts on that? I hate to say that I, I kind of to some degree, I actually blame scientists and our culture to some degree because, you know, we often have all these pop sci articles coming out about these brand new wild theories that most people don't really understand that much. And they get really popular in the news. And then a few years later, it follows apart or gets disproven before it was, should never really been out in the public in the first place at that point. And that, um, you know, a basic conceptualizing, basic theorizing should never be treated as the brand new theory. Someone's got to go out on a limb and try the fringe theories out, but most time they're going to fall through. But they often get presented to the public as though they are very real. And it kind of engenders a certain amount of skepticism in people. They're not going to be able to understand general relativity or string theory very well on their own unless they invest years into studying it. And and so with a lot of these concepts, uh, and the same is true for all those concepts, they feel like they can't really trust the people who are telling them that. They often feel like they have an agenda or that they're wrong a lot. And I think that, I don't feel like that excuses ignorance in the, cause sometimes very really willful ignorance, but I do think that's a, a basis for it that's causing a bit of an eruption there, a lack of trust in, in everything. They trust science and technology in general, mm -hmm. but they, they doubt the motivations of the folks involved in it. <clears throat> mm-hmm. I think that makes sense. Um, so I just want to ask one more question before we jump into mind uploading, and that is um, about you and your channel. What made you, what inspired you to kind of get involved in the science education um, field? Like what made you take the step to open a YouTube channel and um, move on from there? Uh, mostly coincidence. I'd, uh, I'd left college and grad school to join the army. And when I got out of the military, I went into a lot of local civics and governance. and I had been screwing around with something for a PowerPoint thing. I, I was still fairly active with science and sci-fi just as a hobby at that point. And I picked as the topic to do was uh, mega structures, just as a thing to try it out with a concept for using PowerPoint. And um, a few months later, it had gotten a few likes and things like that. I, I did another episode and people liked that one. I did another episode and, and then the channel just kind of emerged as a hobby and then turned into a job as the years wore by. So, yeah, they always say, uh, do something you love. 
and uh i actually i do love my day job but uh i, I love what i do now so I, I recommend that to anybody if you can find a way to get paid for it and you enjoy it follow that path you know hey man Indeed. i mean that's good that's you can't go wrong with that advice um so today we're going to be talking about mind uploading and uh to me i this is the first time i heard about mind uploading um uh, actually i think it was it was mr atheist i believe that was talking to me about this on his channel but um he was was telling me that you know we might get to the point where we're able to map out the brain and be able to kind of transfer that those memories and you know feelings consciousness all that stuff into other types of mediums um and to me that just it just sounded so fantastical and i searched it and found out there was quite a lot of in not only literature but videos just it's flooded yeah it's saturated with things about mind uploading so can you kind of for those like me a little bit ago who weren't familiar with this can you kind of sum up what mind uploading is and then we'll kind of tackle it in detail well the the basic concept is that your brain being a machine of some sort uh it follows a structure and a pattern that we could presumably copy and uh you can emulate them and if if for instance your neurons are the base component. We're not sure, it might go deeper than that, but if your neurons are the base component, there's about 100 billion of those. If you write a computer program that emulates that neuron and its connection to other neurons, you should be able to turn that on and have it act just like you, assuming you copied the base state decently. Um, and then we would say that you would transfer from a neuron substrate to a, a digital one or to a uh, silicon one, if you prefer. And the idea there, of course, is that you're not actually transferring your mind, you're copying it, which is more than a semantic difference because you should probably still be sitting there when you're done. So it's a good way to do a backup, um, but unless you're taking a gradualist approach where you're slowly replacing bits, and you might do that, you might put the computer chips in your head replacing neurons piece by piece, we would usually say that you've just made a copy of yourself, not actually transferred yourself. Um, mm -hmm. And that's really no right or wrong. I'm trying to argue that sort of thing because it's more of a philosophical point about consciousness, identity, and uh, continuity of existence. But uh, by and large, the concept itself is pretty simple. You upload your brain to a computer that emulates the same thing. And the notion is that you, you're not becoming a, an AI, you, um, although humans are already in some ways an artificial intelligence. What you're doing is basically saying, I have this book that is me, it's written on paper, and now I'm going to write it on, you know, uh, lambskin, or I'm going to write it on silicon, or I'm going, you know, Shakespeare is still Shakespeare, regardless of whether it's carved into a wall, written on lambskin, or appears on your computer. Of course, that's not entirely true, because Shakespeare is not going to be quite the same if you're watching a movie version, for instance. And a slogan printed on a t-shirt is not quite the same as one that you have uh, painted onto a wall with graffiti. You know, there's a bit of a difference. Mm. So Absolutely. how important that difference is, is something we won't know until we try it out. And um, you, in, in your video that you did on mind uploading, which is great, guys, you should, uh, I'll link it in the description after the show, but you should definitely check that out. Um, but you made a... Uh, a point to distinguish what a a substrate was and that 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 word is is key to uh, this entire thing can you kind of explain what you meant by that absolutely uh now substrates got a lot of terms you know it's in a lot of different fields but what we usually mean in this context is to compare it to something you would build on top of you know same as you would tamp down the land to build a, a foundation on top of that substrate same as in geology you have a substrate layers of fields in the context of something like data information, um, you know, behind me, I've got some paintings that are on fabric. I've got one that's been on a polyester banner over there. I've got a piece of paper up on the wall. Those are all substrates for data. Um, what's on them is not too heavily affected by what you put them on, though it can be. Uh, that's, again, the analogy there being, I can print a flag on a t-shirt. I can print it on, I could, I could, make my flower arrangement in my front yard, or I could put it on a computer screen. The basic concept remains, but there is a possibility of some differences. You know, uh, it does make a difference what the mm -hmm. substrate is. And uh, it also depends on how good you, you know, what, what your fidelity is in copying it. We don't know that you can just copy neurons by themselves. Some models say that you would need to be able to do a much greater depth into the actual structure of the neuron. If it is just the neurons, though, we had estimated that it took about 10 to the 16th hertz of processing, which would be about um, 
10 million gigahertz of processing power, which we're in the range of being able to do that now. Our best supercomputers have just hit that. And IBM and some others have been modeling neurons um, very, uh, very successfully thus far, but it's still early days. So, <clears throat> and then, of course, the idea is that you should be able to uh, make them much smaller than a brain, though right now our supercomputers that can do that are much, much bigger than a house, and uh, that you should be able to speed them up, which would be a very different game of play. Some of you have subjective mm. uh, times that you would experience. You could slow your mind down, or you could speed it up. And I'll actually, I'll steal a term from uh, Dennis E. Taylor, an author that we discussed in that episode, actually. Uh, he calls it frame jacking, where you just accelerate the speed at which you're thinking. And that could be interesting because our brains work at about the speed of sound. Uh, you know, that, that's how fast neural connections are, that or a bit slower. The speed of light is 10 million times faster than that. So a brain that is identical, only it uses the speed of light to send signals back and forth instead of about the speed of sound, chemical speeds, would be 10 million times faster. That means that three seconds of objective time around you is a year of experience for you. And of course, that would be a great benefit in ways, but yeah. Uh, and of course, you could speed that up even more. If you made a human mind uh, that ran at the same speed we do, it would literally be the size of the planet if it was the exact copy only spread out to work at light speed rather than the speed of sound. That's how big that could be, the size of a planet because of the speed differential. And of course, you could presumably make something smaller than a neuron that did the same job too and compact it even more so that 10 million times speed might only be the tip of the iceberg. And uh, that's where things start to change a bit because you know, if you couldn't think 10 million times faster, if you experience a year for every three or four seconds that passes, that, well, that could easily drive you insane, insane, of course, but, <laughs> you know, you, you would be yeah. ancient uh, before some, you know, somebody had a time to notice there was something wrong. They switched on, you will experience 10 million times faster before you even have a chance to raise your hand to say there's a problem here. Experience months. They might take years of your time just to unplug you in a case like that. That's crazy. Um, but then you think that's crazy. Done in the meantime, and so um, that's kind what, of the what's the concept. time? What's the what's the time frame? I suspect uh, in, for for getting this done for it, for something like that to actually become something we can do. I think I'd be dubious about it happening this century, but it's on the table. It wouldn't be too strange for us to achieve a mind upload this century. Um, some folks, of course, who are on the singularitarian side of things would say sometime in the next 10 years. But I, I think that would be, um, I wouldn't even call that optimistic because I think that would be so reckless to try to get it done that fast that it would probably, probably be a bit of a bad scenario. Um, you know, you do not want to do something like this with half measures. So, but I think it could be something that uh, I would say, you know, we might live to see it because if you actually live to see it, you technically never die. Wild. All right, Steve, I know you wanted to, uh, you had a question that you wanted to jump in with. Oh, I have so many questions. Um, this is, this is an amazing subject. I don't even know where to begin, except there, uh, I'll kind of start here. Um, you had mentioned about like, uh, physical substrate. So how would you introduce something more than just a physical substrate when you're, you're talking about like a consciousness or quality effect? So if I was downloaded into mm -hmm. a, a brain that has a physical substrate, let's say it's a silicon based. Um, how do then I have, do I actually have sensory perception as far as my quality to actually say that it is actually me and rather just than this kind of like emulation of some sort? That's the tricky part, of course, is uh, you can theoretically upload any sensory input to it. Although one should take the caveat that just because you upload a brain there doesn't mean it automatically can do all sorts of strange things like use IR cameras. You still have that same native structure there. If it's an artificial intelligence you build from the ground up, you can add on all sorts of features. The human brain is the, the, the extreme example of kludge, as it is in programming. You know, we have an architecture that's been built up over 4 billion years it does not take modification easily or well. So you, you should be able to plug a camera in, you know, for, to what is the emulated optical visual center for that person. Um, but you, you are going to have to make some modifications, of course. And if you want to start doing weird things like letting people see into ultraviolet or infrared as new colors, that's, you know, that's one of those things where you're going to have to work on that slowly, especially because, again, the brain is kludge. 
any modification you make to it, even the tiniest bit, just like any ecosystem, sometimes they can survive tremendous blows. Other times, even a tiny little poke knocks the whole house of cards down. And, um, you know, you could easily end up with a complete lunatic, uh, even if you just perfectly copy a brain. But um, how would you know that you're conscious? How do you know now? I say, uh, you know, what is real? And I sometimes think the question isn't so much whether, you know, is this real or not, is does it matter? Um, you would have to, you could conceivably give that person an Android body or just sensory inputs to the real world. But you could also, I, I would think, um, you know, they might give a, live in a virtual landscape. And that's the usual assumption. You would make them a virtual reality that they, they spent most of their time in which they could be visited by by those of us using VR goggles or implants or which they might take a stroll out of into an astral, uh, into an Android body. But how you actually prove that philosophically, yeah, that they're philosophically person, I have no idea. <laughs> the, the, the brain states are such amazing things that even a small perturbation in the brain state can have huge consequences. Do you, do you hold in any way to like orchestrated reductionism? Uh, where you have like the consciousness that comes out of quantum states in the brain. Uh, oh, 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 oh. Um, what's called microtubules. I, Penrose's notation yeah. on that. I'm sure, yeah. Uh, orc O R, or I may O R C H O R. I'm never sure if that's pronounced or not. Um, it's the the brain probably does have a, a basic quantum function to it. It's down at the scale where that's possible. And of course, quantum effects can even hit the macroscopic scale. I the thing is I don't think that we can just use quantum as a, a wave around the idea of a, a mechanical universe and say this is random, but the previous version of the universe, you know, the mechanical one was not. And because random, to the best of our knowledge, somehow now we have free will, you know, whereas before we did not. That's always struck me as a bit of a hand wave. Um, we can't predict in either one. You can't predict people's behavior exactly in a mechanical universe, and you can't do it at all in a quantum one. Um, that does not, to me, necessarily mean that you do or don't have it. I, I'm a compatibilist on, on the free will issue to begin with, but uh, I I don't have a problem with Oak all, but I don't think it necessarily is valid either. That's one of those things you got to test out, and trying to test anything with quantum in the brain right now is still a little bit past us to really be um, answering that with authority. So it's a good idea, though. I'm very fond of um, the theory. I would like it to be true. Doesn't mean it is. <laughs> I hate to uh, I hate to interject, it's an but uh, Steve, we're um, YouTube is is doing something choppy, and we're getting a um, a really bad lag, so we're gonna have to restart the um, mm -hmm. the stream. It's it's uh, interfering with how it's going out. So just bear with us one second while we reset this. And um, okay, did we? Cool. Oh, we want to know. Everybody know that I have terrible allergies right now. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, all my audience <laughs> whatever i don't know why i'm having this major reaction right now it's time of year yeah mm -hmm. okay so hopefully uh you guys oh i'm hearing <laughs> i'm hearing you dave um and oh, people man. people about steve's allergies um Great. okay so what we're going to do, uh, welcome back, guys. Uh, sorry about that. I'm not sure what was happening there, uh, but I saw that it was getting a little choppy. So uh, we're going to see if this works a little bit better. And uh, we've, we're talking about mind uploading and sort of the uh, the different principles that go along with that. And Steve, um, I'm going to throw it back over to you to kind of re-ask the last question that you were um, going through so that if you didn't catch it on the last one, this will be a, um, a good way for you to jump back in. So Steve, whenever you're ready. Well, we can kind of uh, expand upon it too, because I was asking him about or orchestrated reductionism, orchestra orchestrated orc reductionism, which was a thing that Penrose had proposed that uh, consciousness comes out of uh, quantum states from microtubules, um, and uh, it's called orc or R R R, and he was giving me his perception on it because I think it's a very interesting and novel approach. Like you said, it has never really been substantiated, but if you want to like give a brief, <clears throat> brief summation, which we just said prior before we had our techn technological problems, maybe. You're yeah. going to understand it better. Why I sneeze again because of my allergies. Forgive me. <laughs> the loose idea behind uh, Orco, and I'm, I'm honestly, I'm not sure how that's properly pronounced as an acronym, um, is that the brain is at such a small level, such a small scale, that you could have quantum effects actually having a major impact on the you know thinking, <clears throat> so that it was not mechanical, uh, that it was quantum random. 
And uh, I love the idea. Uh, I hope it is true, but I haven't seen any evidence to really back that up. At the same time, as I, as I was saying earlier, <clears throat> I don't think it's a good idea for us to take something like free will and say, oh, well, in a classically mechanical or deterministic universe, there is no such thing. But now, just because we have quantum in play, which is inherently random to the best of our knowledge, now you have free will. That's always struck me as conceptually flawed. Um, that just because something is happening randomly, that implies that you you have free will now when before you did not. Um, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I think orchestrated objective reduction. I, I hate this term, orchestrated objective reductionism. That's what it's referred to as. <laughs> I'll, I'll get it right. Even though I was reading about it back in the late 80s, um, it's been around for a very long time. Um, it, it, it could be the case because I, I mean, I'm a determinist. I'm, I tend to compatibilism, but I, I find there are some issues with compatibilism. But let's kind of let's kind of switch over to the, the 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 notion of if you were able to actually download and have quality and have sensory perception into the brain. Um, you mentioned something earlier that I thought was really interesting about speeding up the process. Could you actually overclock the brain such that you would think at, at you know, like much much faster than the speeds we do now, which are considerably, for all practical purposes, slow? Mm -hmm. No, the, the current brain structure is such that we send all of our signals at roughly the speed of sound or a little slower. And then again, the speed of light is about 10 million times faster. So even if you used an identical snapshot of the brain, but you just replaced everything um, with speed of light processing instead of uh, speed of sound processing, your brain should speed up to be about 10 million times faster, which uh, for timeline-wise means that you're experiencing a day in you know a tenth of a second and a year wow. in three seconds. And um, it's, you know, you're, you're, uh, is it three seconds? Sorry, you would experience a day in 0.1 seconds, uh, 0.01 seconds, and you'd experience a year in three seconds uh, if you're going 10 million times faster. And you could probably go even faster than that by compressing that brain a bit since your neurons are, you know, they're cells, they are bigger than a semiconductor switch. Um, <clears throat> But of course, there is a limitation on that, um, besides the whole sanity issue we mentioned, uh, is heat production. Our computers really aren't limited so much these days by size as by how much heat is produced, how much energy is used, and how much heat is produced. Process too fast, you set your brain on fire. And uh, if you try to speed up, you know, right now we do actually create more heat to flip a bit in a computer than we do in our head. Um, and uh, if you suddenly start flipping that many switches, you wouldn't just, you know, get a fever. Your your head would explode and set the entire town on fire. Um, so we do have to get way better at, at our proxy in terms of how much energy we use to flip a bit before we could be thinking about doing something like that um, in any event. And uh, like right now, these supercomputers, these things all, they draw a megawatt to rival the minimum amount of energy, you know, that we need to simulate our human brain theoretically. And... Um, Yet we use maybe 10 watts to run our brain, maybe 20, you know, and so that that is five orders of magnitude that we need to shave off you know, <laughs> before we even be at the same level. And again, that would only let you run a human level brain at a human level speed. You want to start clocking your brain up, uh, frame jacking your brain up to 10 million times the speed it is right now. That's not an issue for communication times, but it certainly is for heat because now you need to run things, well, maybe, um, a trillion times more efficiently than right now to, yeah. to take advantage of that. <laughs> so mm. it's a way on paper, on theory, and in basic scientific concept, it's absolutely doable. Assuming there's no philosophical boundary that's you know going to turn up to say you cannot emulate a human brain or soul. Um, in terms of practical, I would say, you know, Moore's law has been dead for a while, and even if it stayed with us, it would be quite some time. And Moore's law tends to be used for a lot of things. It's the amount of space on a transistor takes up. It's not how fast computers are or how much heat they use. They've tended to go together, but you know we haven't seen cooling improve that much or computer efficiency improve that much. So even most optimistically, following a singularity scenario where an AI you know comes out and just starts improving itself so fast that it you know, explodes into super technology in a couple of days. I think this is something that's going to take us many decades, if not centuries, before we're really doing it. Yeah, you there said two things like, that I think are... <clears throat> but, oh, I'm sorry, I thought you were done. Go ahead. I, I thought you were done. Um, Pardon me. Go ahead. I, I forgot what I was going to say, though, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Some <cat. laughs> Long um, week. <laughs> <means flat>. anyway. <laughs> totally, totally. We, we, we're, we're with you on that. Trust us. Um, 
Yes. I, there's two things that you said that I, I think are major limiting factors. Like you said, I think that there's a, there's a potential for insanity because of the throughput. I don't think, I don't know how the human mind could really handle that kind of throughput. But the other thing I found interesting, um, not, not an area that I'm well versed in. Dave would probably know more about this, but it, when I remember from my, my experience with computers, most of them thought at the time we'd only get down to about a 12 uh, nanometer type chip uh, uh, on the silicon wafers. So I know that they've, come, they've crossed that threshold. They get down about seven nanometers now with silicon, if I'm not mistaken. And theoretically, I'm, I'm going to be hoping here about one, one point something, 1 1.3 for, for a actual silicon would be the most you could the in theory ever get. And it's not just the heat dissipation that you're concerned about, but how do you overcome the quantum tunneling effects in that kind of state? At a fundamental level, and I, you know, a lot of times it's easier to just tell people you really can't get beneath the level of an atom, you know, and we can't even quite get to that level on paper. And of course, people always say, well, we don't know what's possible. We're going to keep breaking the boundaries. But it's worth noting that a lot of the boundaries people have theorized for these things are the same ones they wore back in the 50s or 60s. It's just a lot of practical boundaries have been beaten out of the weight of those theories. I don't know how you would possibly make a computer that could be smaller than an atom per poor, poor bit as a war. Right. Um, and I don't see how you, I mean, you certainly cannot make a super uh, semiconductor that's that size. And uh, even getting it down beneath that, that, that 10 meter man, man, nanometer threshold was pretty impressive chemistry and there's not too much more room to push that some mm -hmm. things do taper off cars are not that much more efficient than they were a century ago they are, are more some, efficient there's some that. brainiacs over at berkeley that are actually pushing five mm -hmm. nanometers right now that's impressive yeah, it that's is crazy. it is you get a car but they they took the gate instead of being metal oxide it's not they're using carbon nanotubes that's how they did it yeah, that's because that's what I read too. They were going to switch it over to some kind of uh, nanotube uh, rather than before. Um, yeah, well, that's you have the only way to get past anything like that. It's gonna, yeah, exactly. It's I know they were looking at using mechanical nanometer. switches with, uh, with carbon nanotubes too. They might switch back to basically a mechanical, you know, the old differential engines version. And that's possible. And there might be a case for that as too. The other thing that matters, though, of course, is not just how tiny they are, it's how fast you can flip them. And that actually matters a lot mm -hmm. with that Landau limit that we were talking about earlier is because the efficiency is based on the temperature and it takes time to cool down. And it takes a very long time to cool down to the ambient temperature when that's something like three Kelvin when it's most efficient. So, you know, you can only switch as fast as you can cool and you can only right. process as fast as you can switch too. Right. And so even if we make these well, things down that scale, you know, trying to say that we're never going to be able to do it is, uh, you know, I can say it all I want. I don't believe it myself. It's a certain day, and nobody else will either. <laughs> you know, we're living under right, two right. centuries of constant technological <laughs> progress. But we don't want to make assumptions about it. I'm picturing. Um, I, I'm picturing something like right. Devereaux or something off like Doctor Who with all these tubes coming out of the head or something for cooling. Oh. You know, <laughs> like you need these massive cooling plants to run this kind of a uh, substrate uh, a brain or something. That the old, be, uh, you need a lot of cooling. The really bad year of Doctor Who special effects on the bold BBC budget. <laughs> um, exactly. There's a you know, uh, it's, it's, the, the there's original a question. Doctor. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, there's there was a question that I think is a really good one that someone in the, in the live chat just asked, and um, they they're asking what methods would be used for mapping and creating the copy of a person's brain. So how would they map like map those? <clears throat> Um, neurons and stuff in your brain. You know, and that is the really tricky part. We've obviously gotten way better with MRI machines, but you know, there are a hundred billion neurons in a you know the night they have pleasantly placed bricks. You know, there's this giant web of goo. Basically, um, how do you actually map those states? And you can't just take a snapshot of where each one exactly is. You need to see what all the connections are and what the potentials on those are, because that changes too. Um, there are two ways that we usually say about going about this uh, that uh, besides just improving scanning technology a lot. One is that you hit the person with a really powerful laser, a, a, a disgustingly powerful one that will literally vaporize each layer. And this is popular in sci-fi because it lets you actually do that brain transfer because you're eliminating the person while you're doing it so that there's no leftover person. So they vaporize your brain with, you know, that's basically because they're not using the laser for fun. They're using it for that level of, of lighting and accuracy, that, that extreme level of resolution. Uh, and that is a lot of energy you need to achieve that level of resolution. 
especially because you need to take that snapshot pretty fast. The other one is, uh, I think Alistair Lounders used to call it like a beta towing um, simulation, which is basically where you're constantly observing that person. Either they are reactions externally or more likely with a lot of nanotechnology running around their brain, taking samples of all the neurons, repairing them here and there, possibly replacing them with uh, synthetic ones when they break down. And uh, it, those just build up an image. Uh, they, they map the whole area out in pieces, like a uh, little robot car is mapping out the roads here for Google. And uh, they transmit that picture. And you're never going to get perfect resolution with something like that because they're not going to map everything simultaneously. But do you need perfect resolution with the human mind? Because again, I'm not the person I was when I opened my mouth a second ago, let alone you know an hour ago. And yet I'm still that same person. And uh, well, I'm getting to the whole Theseus ship argument, but that ship has, as we said, already sailed because we clearly are not the same you know, material we were when we were born. I have probably only a few random atoms left over from that period, probably only by coincidence of having re-inhaled them at some point. Um, there was none of me left of the original state, but the continuity has remained. And if that's what we're using for, identific- you know, for ID in the old John Locke sense of it, then that gradualist approach of taking photographs here and there and building up a map, not a perfect copy, but close enough. <clears throat> and that, and that's the uh, that's the, the other question that I had is, uh, in your opinion, is it still you when, when, when we do this? Like, when does it stop being, you know, Isaac Arthur, when once you're uploaded into another medium that, that carries this copy of your conscience, is it still technically you or is it a completely different person just with those memories intact of who you used to be that becomes one of those well as i say if i make a copy of myself that is not me it's not me if it's having a conversation with me the next day and has been off doing something else in the meantime while i've been doing something else we have now divorged um even assuming there wasn't divergence in the copying act we are now two separate people but there's nobody more qualified to be me than that copy was like if i do the back of my brain we don't live just for our own existence. What's the biggest reason for continuity? You want to make sure someone's taking care of your, your work for you, your family, your friends. That copy might not be you, but it's still a person, and it's the closest copy you can possibly get. We talk about people using their children for their immortality. This is a lot closer than that. <laughs> so, um, but mm-hmm. as to it being you, you can produce various ways in which you could say, yeah, in that case it is, but you can always challenge those. You can always shake those up a little bit. Um, you know, let's say I copy myself onto it and I follow with dead and that person says, oh, that's him. Only we, we come back and start me back up a few years later because they stuck me on ice and, you know, while they were probing my brain and then they learned how to fix whatever I had. Now there's two of me. One of those guys has been living my life the entire time while the other who's in my original body with my original brain has not, which one of us is now me. What if I scramble a bit of my memory into somebody else, do a screw up changeover, and now I've got his year five and six, and he's got my year seven and eight? Is that a new person? Is it the old person? Um, you know, again, I, these are—I don't think these are answerable questions in the sense of being definitive, but they're, they're ones we have to think about in the near future. You know, and and obviously the mm-hmm. answers to them that we choose are very important. I think that it's. In most of these cases, it's always going to depend on what the circumstances are, but it's about as close to you as you can get. Uh, that's probably the best answer we can have. Um, I have one more follow-up, Stephen, and I'm um, turn it back over to you. But um, how long would this be able to continue? Like how many, once you're uploaded into a different medium, is that you until, uh, like, can you decide that you want to just go offline? And I guess is that the same thing as as dying? They were- is there are a couple of answers on that one. We say that the longest you could possibly exist is about 10 to the 100th years, um, be a trillion, 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 trillion years uh, before you would run out of any energy at the absolute upper maximum theoretical. On the other hand, though, because you can make copies of yourself, you can make backups of yourself that prevent you from being erased. And if you got enough backups, it should be statistically impossible for somebody to get them all. So you never actually would be dying until the universe was over. But uh, how do you kill an immortal? You can get them to kill themselves, or you can wait patiently till they do themselves in. Let's say that there's an effective half-life of someone where, say, after 10,000 years, the average person typically says, 
I'm tired of dragging all these memories around with me. I am the only person who has access to them and authority to them to, you know, to remove them. But I'm just tired of all that baggage. 10,000 years of life, I want to experience something new. I'm deleting my memory. And not everyone's going to do that, but it's a probability at all times that someone might feel that way. Maybe the average is 10,000 years. So now you have a half-life. Almost nobody lives beyond that because they just delete their memories at some point. Or, you know, other things like that. Every so often there's a coup that goes and blows up the whole system. So there's really no pathway to absolute immortality in the sense of the world. And then you also have to ask how much of the identity is really left over just because it's got that continuity. I'm still continuous from whatever amoeba first divided into other amoeba and evolved into everything else. That's a continuity. There has never been a cell that didn't divide on that pathway from me to it. I am not that amoeba by any sane definition. So is is an intelligence that's being copied and expanded for millions of years even conceivably classified as me? And of course, it, it depends. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, um, what, about, what about what right? about? <laughs> I have I have one more that um, just just came to me uh, on the tail end of that about the um, the stopping of the the memories. Could could things like um, uh, you know? The, the things that interfere with the grid now or the worries that we have uh, of, you know, solar uh, interference, those kind of things. Could that technically, like if the grid goes down, basically, would that be a way that would just crash everybody's system? Like if, if you're running on an electrical um, impulse, once you transfer <laughs> over, would things like that, like if it went down power wise, how would that affect the, the person's memories or potentially you know, would mean, that take them offline? <laughs> How are you structuring that person? You can always take security measures that are going to protect you from this or that disaster. And considering it's your life and your identity, you're going to take some pretty extreme examples because you don't want anyone hacking you. It's, it's not even just dying. You don't want someone plumbing through your memories. Um, so you would tend to think the people who were actually offering that service to copy your brain would use every last backup scenario we come up with. You know, we got triple offsite security. Everything's in lead line bunkers 100 meters under the ground. Uh, we don't store you on the cloud, you know, but um, then, of course, that costs money. <laughs> that costs time. So yeah. th is there a way for that to end on someone? And again, what we'd say is you can copy someone as much as you want. There should be, for any given doomsday scenario for you personally, a finite probability of it happening that introduces essentially a half-life. You might, I might only have a 1% chance of getting a car accident this year and dying from that. I, I would think it's much lower than that, actually. Um, but over time, if I have a 1% probability of doing it, nothing changes that, I am eventually going to, you know, die in a car accident. Over a million years, it's going to happen, you know? Um, and so for any right. one of these things, it's just, can you use it to a truly astronomical probability, and how much so? So that it's less likely than not to happen in a trillion years or a million years, and again, whatever that time frame is, is your half-life. Fascinating. Okay, Steve. You know, you had mentioned earlier about the ship of, of Theseus, and, and there's actually a, a pretty easy resolution to that. Uh, it's called mirrorological nihilism that uh, I don't particularly hold to, but it's a fascinating concept. And, and basically, I, as you may know, but people may watch you not know, mirrorological nihilist would purport that uh, objects don't really exist in any kind of uh, existential sense. They basically are just rearrangements of what's called primitives, things that like atoms and everything else is just mere rearrangements. So just by taking one part away from something and, and replacing it. It doesn't matter because the ship of Theseus didn't exist in the first place. But we all yeah. we all love those kind of those arguments. But um, I, a what you're saying for, uh, it's, 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 oh yeah no it's brilliant. I I love I, I find mirrorological nihilism to be fascinating for that reason. Um, but when you're talking about like the, the the infidelity in the in the replication process that can lead as an aggregate to total system failure, um, that that to me is just entropy there's it, eventually that has to lead into something like that um I have, I have two questions i can think about top of my head so I'm, there's so many different things to talk about with this because i happen to like this topic um the first thing would be um something when it comes to like the more split brain when they have you know a dissection between the middle and they've noticed that people can have independent type thoughts um and again let's this is this is completely hypothetical you're a futurist so you work in this genre of hypothetical things um split so blunt brain but you took you're able to actually i, I love it <laughs> you're able to take the brain apart and and literally put it in two different mm -hmm. I, I don't know if you want to say bodies or whatever units to make them ex 
uh, exist or subsist, I think would be the case because I wouldn't call that really existence. But do you, each person retains a specific part of the memory um, because that we've, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, memory is not really stored in one specific place. It could be multiple different places, just like genes, right? I mean, you have like, they're all affected with gene expression from across the whole genome. So the brain is, is like all over the place when it comes to certain things like memories, is it not? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And there's a lot of, uh, I don't want to show I say, redundancy to it because there's the brain is surprisingly sturdy to certain types of damage. Um, I, again, to go to the ship of thesis, well, let's not use that ship. We'll say the Statue of Liberty. If I cut the Statue of Liberty in half, and because uh, you know, it's gotten sliced in five and falls down there, and someone comes by and puts a plastic top on top of that now to fix the part that fell over, while somebody else tows away the main part of the statue and, and wrecks it with a new base in some other place, who's got the Statue of Liberty now? Which one of those is the real one? And, and again, of course, that's, you know, how do you identify an object as itself? And yet at the same time, as we're saying with the, with the, um, with the, the uh, reductionist thing, um, we know that these objects exist. We might be wrong about that. Maybe there is no such thing as a real object, but we know that they do. And that's one of those examples where you say, I don't know if I can actually prove this, but there's no real benefit to me for believing otherwise. An apple is a thing. Even though every apple that was existing when that tome was invented um, has long since decayed. You know, new apples arise. They come in many tastes and flavors. But there is an apple. This concept exists. And I, I feel like if we get too reductionist, it's kind of missing the point. You know, it, it's, it's, this universe is the substrate that we exist in. The concepts, to me, are the parts that matter. And I can't prove that objectively, obviously. Sure. Um, if you cut someone's head in half in a way that keeps them survive sectioning, right? And you then go ahead and attach some new brain there, you know, some cloned brain or artificial, you know, substrate to each one of those halves. Which one's the real person? The original. Right. The, yeah. If you destroy, <laughs> even, if you destroy you know, one of the brains, are you killing the person? If you now have two brains and you and you smash one of them, are you? Did you kill the person, or what did you kill? And even with the copy and say, we say it's a perfect copy and say, well, it's only a perfect copy if it doesn't know it's a copy. Um, right. Again, to go the one fellow, because the Dancy Taylor such, does such great work on this one with his books. They all, they made tons of copies of themselves. This one entity called Bob, we all legion. Um, but they all knew they were a new copy. And each one had to pick a new name out, you know, and they started picking out fictional characters. Uh, it was the first thing they did, pick a new name, right? And they'd go to favorite characters. They'd be like Cork or Spock or other geeky names because it's a very geeky character, right? Uh, I think they eventually had to get to like Homer Simpson because they were running out of things. And each one would kind of take on a little bit of that persona. You know, it, it, not, not that they'll be coming that, but we all have multiple aspects to our personality and we emphasize some of them in certain other company. And if we all want to be a little bit individualistic, especially in a room full of copies of ourselves, so we're going to act more like that person. We're going to maybe take on some of that that part of us shifts, that that part of our personality emphasizes. And that happens right away. And if you know you're a copy, it has to happen right away because the first divergence occurs the moment you say, oh my God, I'm a copy. You know, that's, that's a change in my life. Um, and it's a major one. It's not just one routine day, which yeah. any routine day is already divorced you. But, um, you know, it's how do you define but, but identity? You still have existence, though. It still exists. Mm -hmm. You still exist. I'm we, a copy you know, of my parents in that regard. Yeah, I oh, and that's you know we distinguish you between your parents, right? And say if I clone right. myself, is that my son or my little brother, or or is it me? <laughs> and it all depends on the context. And we have these terms. They 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 exist in all context. Obviously, they're what we evolved our civilization around. And we're going to have to slowly adjust them as we have so many other things. We adjust and we saw them as we go. And that's not to say you put it off to the future. You, you wait to the day of the emergency to try to find a solution to it. You're kind of screwed. You think about the stuff in advance. You know, you don't wait till you see a trolley heading towards innocent people and a switch next to you to decide what you're going to do in that case. <laughs> um, there's we not really a, a whole answer, show on the trolley, by the way. <laughs> Yeah, we and definitely get spent. We have spent shows on the trolley problem, by the way. Have you we have done many episodes on um, this show. Oh, it's, oh, it's, yeah. We've we've gone down the routes of trolley problems like you couldn't even imagine. This is the most bizarre versions of the trolley problem. Um, by the way, I, I, I want to ask you, you get back to something real quick. So, so, 
Mm-hmm. Go ahead. I'm sorry. What, I'm sorry. What no, you no, go ahead. Oh, um, you, you just go ahead. I, we like, I like going down tangents every so often, but you talked about apples. Um, people out there, stop eating red delicious apples. Go get yourself a real apple. Get a Fuji. Get a, um, uh, a, a, even a, even a, a Granny Smith, a Golden Delicious, a Macintosh. Um, there are like literally hundreds of types of apples out there. And the most common one is the worst. He's a cook above me. He could probably tell you more about this. You know, a chef actually. Um, he could tell you the best apples. A cook. People have people go out and they. Just, How dare you, sir? You're a chef. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's been reduced to chef. How dare you? Do you sir. have a preference for a particular type of apple? Um, I like I, I like Fuji. Um, <laughs> Fuji's a good. Yeah, Fuji's a good. Uh, I'm you know my area uh, <laughs> what, what's that? from Northeast Ohio to New York, big apple territory. Um, I'm fond of Granny Smith's for pies. I like Red Delicious. It's just that that basic yes. crisp eating apple on a hot. Pie. Um, but uh, no. you one should one should definitely eat more than one type of apple because they do all have a different flavor to them. Yep, it's a subconscious. Oh, Galas are good apple, too. I, think, I like uh, apple. Color. I like to. I, I like I, galas in I, I um, in yep. pies. I think they uh, they they melt well, or they not melt, but they they caramelize a lot. Uh, a lot better. It's, they're a lot more suited for that. They're um, the structure of the apple is a little bit firmer, so it holds up better, and so you're able to get a, a good caramelization and still have kind of that that crisp crunch when you uh, eat it without the sogginess that you get like from um, just a you know like a red yeah. delicious or something like that. Go. That yeah, they just turned to applesauce basically. Uh, real quick, I want I wanted to break in and ask a question that just kind of uh, I, I just thought of on this. So let's hypothetically say that we, we get to the point where this is happening. We are able to upload our brains and we're, uh, you know, we're in a different medium and that person, let's say murder someone. Okay. If the option came to where, you know, we're, this now is involved in the, the legal aspect of it. And let's say instead of the death penalty, they just delete your memories. Like that's part of the punishment. But what if this person has a backup copy of their memory somewhere and or this person, the, their their one copy is imprisoned, but someone tries to activate that second copy? Like, what do we do at that point you know, with with the possibility of having someone getting punished for something that they do, but having a backup of that person somewhere else? Now, that's that's an interesting question, because it also is going to depend on whether or not the backup remembers the crime. Let's imagine for the moment that uploading was a pretty pr- simple process. You could do it at a quick station. It took like an hour. I am going to kill someone. I decide I'm going to kill him. I go get to make a copy of my brain first, and then I go shoot that person. That copy now has no memory of that crime. You say, well, he wasn't there for it, but maybe he was still tempted. What if it's a copy that existed before I even made that decision to make a crime? And again, we have a difference between attempted murder and actual murder for a reason. We, until the crime has actually taken place, you know, people say, if I shot a gun at you and it's got blanks in it, but I didn't know that, how is that any different than a murder? And again, that's one of those long legal arguments about whether or not you, uh, you know, the attempt it should be as bad as the crime. Um, but if we're going back before I've even made that decision, you know, if it's still an attempt, I haven't even thought of having yet, that backup of me surely can't be found guilty. You know, if I go out and murder my, my ex because I found her having an affair on me, the copy of me that was made before I found out can't be held responsible, surely. Um, at the same time, uh, with a copy of somebody who actually was there for the murder itself, how can they not be considered just as guilty as the original? They both were there. They both experienced it. But if we're going as that the basis that I experienced it, I remember it, could I screw over my victim twice by giving a copy of my memories of killing that person to, say, the kid or their copy, so now they remember and experience the crime too? Is that person also now guilty of it because they've shared the same as the copy is? And I have no idea. I asked a friend of mine, uh, Colleen, she's a judge of the Court of Appeals locally, and... Uh, and she stared at me for a minute or so and said, I have no idea. <laughs> and she's very forward thinking about these things. So she always tolerate me asking these questions. But, you know, again, we don't know yet. These are crimes of the yeah. future that we need to really think about. You know? uh, although I should say, she expressed the opinion that would probably have to follow the corpse. If there's not a corpse for the crime, 
it you probably can't uh, if there's not a body attached to whoever did the mortal, they probably could not be prosecuted. Not as necessary. That's how it should be, but how the law would probably have to, to interpret it right now. So in that wow, context, that the copy mind. of your mind. <laughs> and, it's crazy. You know, of course, one of the nice things about this class of civilization is that if you've got copies of minds very easily, it should be very hard to actually kill someone for keeps. So uh, hopefully it won't come up too often. <laughs> Murder yeah, is a thing of the past because you have everybody immortal for all practical purposes. Right, Steve. So you know, so. yeah, I mean, you have to redefine mortal if two people decide to kill each other, and but their copies are backed up. Yeah. Um, who do you who do you prosecute then? <laughs> you know? Yeah, you well, I think you have to there? redefine a lot of things in the law. Clearly, I mean, you you again, we're dealing with with clones per se that have the same memories and same emotions. I like what you said though about um, committing a crime. If you so try to shoot somebody and it has a, you know a blank in it, you know why are you mm -hmm. only charged with attempted murder, vice murder when the intent was the same? And are we judging upon intent? Are we judging upon the outcome of that intent? And that's something to be talked about when it comes to theory of justice. Um, a guy named uh, Rawls, John Rawls, wrote a lot about theory of justice and de different types of distributive justice and retributive and re restoration, restorative justice. And I and I think these things are completely brought up along uh, along those lines. What are we actually punishing a person for? Um, are we per punishing them for what they've done to somebody else? Are we punishing them to prevent them from doing it again? Are we punishing them to, to um, punitive wise? Um, and you know, if we had all these different clones to worry about, now we just have created the 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 content and blown up the ontology to the point of almost being unwieldy, <clears throat> unless something is is critically changed in our foundational thinking of what it actually entails to be a person. And as you said, having a body to deal with. You, how do you kill something that doesn't have a physical body? Um, in that regard, because that's how we've always known it to be, because we've known under, no other way. We've never seen a mind disassociate from the body. Like you said, it has to have a physical substrate. I don't think we've ever um, experienced dualism I, in that way. I don't think that there is a dualism. I'm, I'm more of a, I'm a, mon, a, mono, a monoist when, when it comes to that. So I, mean, I, I think dualist. it would have to be a, a complete Are you dualism? And that's why I stand. <laughs> it, it to me it appeals more. I have no, no, no it's, it's logical evidence to back it up. It's just my preference. Same with free will. I choose to assume I have them. <laughs> well, wait, let me, let, um, wait this is going to be a whole other topic. But libertarian free will or free will? I mean, do you think that uh, are you are you are you are you an indeterminate or an indeterminacy person? This is uh, fascinating. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm compatibilist by, but I, I, I hate to subscribe to any one specific camp. And I always like to put the I caveat on these things that. I'm not expressing a belief that this is definitely right. I express the belief that it's it's what resonates with me personally better is what I would like to be true. And I would like to assume that I have a genuine free will that can make decisions. At the same time, I'm obviously not, you know, I you can influence people. You know, if you can copy people's minds, you can copy only part of it. And we influence each other all the time, you know? I mean, the very literal nature of us, we don't like to put it in a negative term, but we brainwash people into adulthood. Uh, for their own good, for our own good, uh, but it is what we are doing. It's just not, you know, mean as it were. Uh, it's the motivation behind it. But, uh, you know, I don't think you can really prove or unprove something like free will, and I don't see any benefit to me to, to believe me otherwise, is essentially my reasoning on that one. Not the strong logic of this is why it's true, but rather this is why I prefer it. And, um, and it's, you know, there there is in these kind of contexts with a lot of these mind uploads, it really does make a difference which which camp you're in for how you perceive these things. But I feel like if you go too reductionist on these things, if, if we do go the path that says, essentially, that the, the nihilistic approach in the first place, I think you're always removing not so much what the truth is, but any motivation for why you care what the truth is. You know, one can't just say that uh, the truth in of itself is a worthy goal in of itself. Why? If, if there's no meaning to life, then why is that a worthy goal? <laughs> you know? um, and, um, you know, again, that's a, more of an opinion than, than a philosophical stance. And I forgot my yeah, question. Um, was. And I, and I, <laughs> um, yeah, what, what were we talking about? Apples, I think. Um, I, I happen to agree with you. <laughs> I is going to get over and over again. Probably the motor topic with a knife, too. So. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I I tend to compatibilism as well. Um, it is a deterministic position that allows for some type of free will, but I don't even call it free will any longer. I I prefer the term will. Uh, a friend of mine named Rationality Rules had a discussion with another friend of ours named Matt Dillahunty 
they they use the term will and i thought it was a much better way to say it which is the ability to choose because i don't think we have libertarian free will um, i'm not an indeterminacy uh person when it comes to that but um uh i think it's peter in in in, v, in wagon in i don't know how to pronounce his name peter in uh in wagon is that how you pronounce his name he he has he I and a few other people had, had actually yeah. I'm terrible at pronouncing these names. Ask anybody. I'm horrible at it. I I, I just know the concepts. Uh, but they have arguments against compatibilism. And just like anything else, all these positions have pros and cons. Like you said, I can't subscribe to any specific one of them. I just go by which one's most convenient, mm -hmm. which is compatibilism. Um, but to try to change the, the topic a little bit so we don't get too deep in philosophy, the, one of the first things somebody said to me in this live chat before we started was, Steve, don't talk about philosophy. I'm like, do you understand that we're going to be talking about brains oh, <laughs> in a vast kind of stuff? Not, philosophy. We were just talking about law a moment ago and theory of justice. And, you know, you either say science and futurism. The future is, it, we would just say science if that's all there was to it. You can't limit it. And this is a criticism I have for a lot of folks these days. The whole Aristotle and idea of educating the whole person sometimes gets forgotten. You should have a specialty, of course. We have, you know, that's that society. You have something you specialize in. But people have tended to treat philosophy in recent years as, as a poor bastard orphan child of no value when it, it, it remains, you know, one of the most fundamental ways that you hone your brain, <laughs> your arguments. And it shows when people haven't, you know, I, not yet a gal there to read every last book, but you have to be thinking about these concepts. And it always behooves you to check and see if other people have done the footwork for you already. So, you know, pick up a copy of Kant, pick up some Pop or pick up some Locke. Um, and uh, maybe, you're, maybe you're, don't you're pick up some. Into the water on this one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're doing it Hegel. Right don't, don't, don't read you're Hegel. Yeah, you're working for me, man, because I mean, I, I read Kant, I, re I, read, I read these things, and um, I agree with you fully because I think that. This is my personal outlook on this. Without epistemology or meta epistemology, things of that, that nature, you don't know how to, to, to determine what is truth, what is knowledge, what's a fact, what's your theory of knowledge, your theory of justification. These are all things that are stemming from philosophy. So even the guidance of, of science is, is predicated on the position of, of methodological naturalism, which is the philosophy of science. And when people say they don't like science or philosophy, they find no use for it. They're actually saying they find no use for logic. They find no use for reason. They find no use for what is true. They find no use for what is uh, knowledge. They find no use for just about everything that we talk about. And it's just like, I don't think they're understanding the influence that they're having by telling people philosophy is useless because it's the act, philosophy is the basis from which we stem all these other things that we we talk about. They had everything, matter of fact, this is an interesting yeah, trick. This is true. To I've done this yeah. before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a doctor of philosophy, science, right? That's what it. So, um, this is a true thing. You can go. Everybody listening, try this because I know you're not going to believe me. So, you guys like to have evidence. Go to Wikipedia, pick any entry you want, and then click the first link in that entry. That's not like the um, like the Greek or the the spelling or anything like that. But actually, in the body of the explanation, whatever hyperlink, yeah, whatever hyperlink you come to, click that link. Keep clicking and the next page and the next page and the next page. And eventually, no matter how many times you search for something, you click and click and click. Guess what page it always comes eventually do? It reduces to philosophy. Philosophy. Uh, and somebody actually begin. proved this by, by computer. They actually did a crawl <laughs> and, and proved that. Is that real? Yes. I've I've hoped it's real, and it's one of those ones where I don't feel obliged to check it because it's it fundamentally is conceptually right. The basis of all thinking has to be on what is thought, what is knowledge, what what are the you know, we say um, science takes a particular version, and I'm going to mess it up. Actually, is it empirical real? No, um, it's a specific rule of thought that you can't technically prove, but you're required to go with it because it's the only pragmatic way to follow these bits of knowledge. But just because it's the only pragmatic way to do it in the current context does not mean it automatically produces the correct answer. Nor is it ever mm -hmm. going to, you know, you're never going to find a, a particle of justice. You're never going to find an atom of, of love out there. Uh, you would find some strange and charmed quarks, but that's about the extent of it. And I guess we have a beauty quark too, but again, unrelated. <laughs> they, 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 well, they uh, so well, actually, you're, 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 you're you're, you're, you're dating yourself because we're old school. It used to be up, down, strange, charm, beauty, truth. But no, no, not any longer. It's up, down, strange, charm, top, top, and, bo top, top, top and bottom. So, so yeah. we are old school on this stuff, right? We don't have strange anymore or whatever. It's like, come on, really? Uh, scientists like to... Oh, it's like Pluto's no longer... <laughs> what? 
Now, I think the they idea love to was do they that, weren't letting us. physicists name particles because they always came out really weird, and you end up with uh, lucky charms particles, strange particles, uh, every last mm -hmm. Greek letter particles, and of course, quarks themselves are defined as a noise that's not quite like the sound that geese make when they honk. That's, that is literally what that means. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's better than doing anything in French or Latin, but you know, they weren't trying to be snobby by using and, French and Latin at the time. They're happy what language they spoke. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, right? I, th I think you may have been referring to either Google's incompleteness theorem or the pro Hume's problem of induction. I don't know. Either one of them have is you know, you, you never have a complete system. And no matter whatever if you, you can never prove the consistency logically of a of a single system, um, because you always run into what's called the Munchausen trilemma. But uh, uh, um, oh, I, I, let me, I want to ask one thing because um, we're, we're we're getting close to the um uh, to uh, a, a little over an hour, and I want to leave time for the the people who have asked questions in the live chat. But um, I wanted to touch on one thing very briefly, and that is your uh, your video on mind control. Can you give us a, a synopsis of your rundown on that? Because I thought I found that fascinating and how that would that would work. The the key thing about mind control, of course, is to acknowledge that it's already going on. And uh, at a fundamental level, you're just trying to get a little bit better at it. You know, hypnotism, things like that have been in play for years with a limited effectiveness. But we would use mind control. Any way you've got access to a human brain, any sensory input, you know, audio visual is great for subliminal, high bandwidth, but smell works. Look at pheromones, right? If you can use it to to poke at the brain in any fashion, to the thoughts in any fashion, you can use that to influence someone. And if you know what you're doing well enough, you should be able to use it to influence people to do exactly what you want. But of course, even when you're talking in context, like we were saying with mind uploading, you don't necessarily have to do much influencing. You can just go there and, and just tweak things into the, what you want them to be. Um, you don't have to do much effort influencing them. And um, it's a big concern for future societies, of course, is that you might start using mind control, not because of some tyrannical 1984 regime popping out of nowhere, though that obviously is always a concern, uh, but rather because it's so easy to slide in there, it will be so tempting. And and I, I, you know, we were talking justice earlier. I have somebody who comes in and they've committed some kind of crime, um, but they're not really an evil person. You know, we're not. We're talking. Um, they they bust up their neighbor's house with a bat after their guy, uh, you know, ran his lawnmower over his dog or something. This is not an evil person. We don't really want to punish them, but we can't have them behaving that way. So we say. What we can do is just tweak you so you'll be a little less violent, or you'll never commit that specific crime again. And people would tend towards that. It's optional punishment. You don't have to. You can go do the jail sentence, or you can take the brainwashing. Say, uh, you're in jail or brain... Oh, yeah, okay, I, a lot of people are going to pick the one. But then you might start going a little bit further where you say, you know, we've got technology that allows anybody to make a bomb in their basement. And not like a small bomb, like, you know, a destroy New York State bomb. We can't risk that technology out there and random lunatics. So we're going to condition everybody, not a lot, just a little bit, so they won't do that. And most will say, well, at the extinction of the species versus just a little brainwashing, I can, I can swallow that. But it's like the security versus um, you know, privacy thing. It's not a question of, of one mm -hmm. or the other. You have to find that comfortable spot in the middle, and then you have to make sure it doesn't drift. Because it's always so tempting to let it drift. Uh, we're just going to brainwash you so you don't insult people anymore. <laughs> yeah, don't you want that? Wouldn't you volunteer? Yeah, you wouldn't even do it on accent. Wouldn't that make you... Hey, can we fix and flat earthers? It's not even the brainwashing that's compulsory. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even the brainwashing that's compulsory to work about COVID because it's going to be a huge industry. We don't have to worry about governments forcing it on us to develop the technology. We'll do it ourselves. Self-help books sell by the billion. Imagine mm -hmm. if we're willing to buy things that don't even work most of the time I can just walk in and say, I don't want to smoke anymore. Click. Yay. Now that cost me a hundred bucks. I don't even want to smoke anymore. I want to be more confident. Isn't, Click. I'm more confident. Yeah. <laughs> isn't that a slippery slope yeah, though? Yeah, like, yeah. Uh, you know, once, once we decide on like what social behaviors that we don't want to, you know, have in our society, like number one, who's going to make that decision? Like, who's that going to be left up to? And number two, that to me seems like a slippery slope because you first start out with, you know, overly egregious behaviors, obviously, but how long before it gets to mm -hmm. the small, you know, kind of just, you know, the people who are, are annoying, who like to drone on, like, where do you stop the, uh, the, the, the clicking, you know, the click, where do you stop that? 
the biggest problem with the slippery slope assumption is always that the slippery slope is ahead of you um, and that you're not already tumbling down it. We already uh, know yes. that's the problem. Increase technology. You know, we can get better at doing it. We can get better defenses technologically too. There'll be a big market for self-help brainwashing. There'll also be a big market for keeping people from brainwashing you. But at the end of the day, many of these aren't technological debates of the future. We already have to deal with this, and not now, in the past too. Um, this is a constant struggle with us. The individuals, the group, the collective will versus you know the, the deviation from it. Um, that basic moral concept has not changed, and I've never heard a perfect right answer to it any more than we had with with consciousness and identity earlier. Um, you know, one could be the iconoclast, one could be the person who says, "I I am totally my own person," and no, you're not. <laughs> you know? I, I've never been subject yeah. to brainwashing. Yeah, we all have been. Um, and it's it's more about defining the terms under which it's acceptable. And uh, if, if the assumption is it's got to be voluntary to some degree. Um, but we have thus far navigated that to a point where we have in many ways more privacy than our ancestors had. Uh, but we also have more history than our ancestors had. If you got exiled out of the tribe, everybody knew what you did in the tribe, you know. But you could always leave the tribe to another place. It was a death sentence for most of history. But, you know, the last few centuries, you could just move to a new town, change your name, and nobody knew who you are. Now, you've got a lot more privacy, but you have, you know, with what goes on Facebook is there forever. And so, you know, these are right. changing paradigms. And some people don't re recognize that. Yeah. Some people don't recognize that what you put on Facebook lingers there forever. It doesn't go anywhere. The internet never forgets. And um, some, you know, the, the, the 12 to you know 18 year olds that are posting just every aspect of their life. I wonder if they're going to regret doing that, you know, when they get, yeah, into, by uh, the way, if, if you go to my timeline, guys, don't look at anything prior to 2008, please. Just, it never happened. <laughs> never <laughs> happened. Because, uh, I deny it all. Just, Assume anything you do online is recorded, including your email. Assume the NSA is looking at them. They probably aren't. And oh, I, yeah. I'm sure they're not in my case because I sent a note asking them to do spell check. If you're going to spy on my stuff, could you at least do spell check? Because um, I don't like typos in my emails. Um, but uh, so, you know, yeah, it's one of those things where there's all that data is out there. It's available. It's hackable. But there's so much of it. And most of the time, people don't really care about the individual. They're not really caring about you. They're just, you know, your number that they're trying to get a statistical sample on. But um, it's still, it's there. Everything you do, if somebody wants to, they'll be able to look it up. And, you know, we do have to find some way to address that because memory is only going to get cheaper. Cameras only get cheaper. What do you do when people start walking around with disposable cameras on their clothing? When, when cameras have gotten so cheap and bandwidth so cheap that it becomes normal to integrate, you know, sensors and cameras into your clothing. You would do that just for safety. I mean, how, you, how do you kill somebody if, if they got a camera on you? You might do it as a kind of passion, but... Everybody knows where they were. Even if you block it, they know where they last were, and they know where you last were, and they know where everyone who was a witness to their crime was. They can take a peek. Right? You're recording everything, and it becomes second nature to you to record everything. Um, is it okay for you to upload that? Is it yours? It's your memories, but uh, you know, could you, 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 let's say it's not cameras. It's just your memories and the digitized. Can you upload that? Can we set up a parameter on Facebook that will automatically blow anybody if they, you know, if they don't say yes to the tag? It just automatically IDs that person and they blow out or get a question mark over their face. Um, unless they think it's okay to tag you. Keep that in whole videos. Um, and then, of course, they're not necessarily in your clothing. They might be plugged into you so that even when you're not wearing clothing, you're seeing these people. How does that handle in a relationship when you break up? How many recorded hours of that? Yeah. Is you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah well, those, those are some of the memories I want to have removed. If we're ever able to like just go in and say, we want to remove this particular memory. Yeah. There's always, always, you always have an X that you will be like, yeah, you know, just take that little part out. But anyways, um, we are going to get some super chats. I just have one really quick last question. Um, Cause I am personally curious about this. It's easy theoretically to take um, any kind of like explicit knowledge and put it into a system. I'm explicit by me, which I mean information that can be transported from one medium to another books and things like that nature. But when it comes to things like, um, experiential like t uh, tacit knowledge how like i know how to play the guitar a little bit right would we be able to actually transfer that ability as well because that's knowledge that's a prior posteriori there's no way we could have the ability to play guitar a a priori so is that something you think would also be something that's transferred the my ability to, to play an instrument and actually explain to people how to do that because that knowledge is not really a tangible knowledge in any kind of way it's not an explicit knowledge it 
if we're copying the complete state of your brain, it should come with you. But it's one of those things, how do you transfer? You know, we are not a computer with a nicely stored digital archive. I can't transfer my memories from January 2nd, 2003 uh, as a little discrete bit. They're not, they're not set up that way. Um, mm -hmm. If we assume for the moment that all of your memories and the thoughts that you had of those memories of playing the guitar and the time you spent ruminating about how to play the guitar and all the little nervous fiber signals that you have to send around to play the guitar are all stored in your brain, then if you copy the whole thing as is, you're good. Got to be careful copying that, though, because you can copy an entire library, but if you don't get all the pages together, you know, you know now you've got a, a problem. They're all out of sort of, you know, the, the knowledge is there. But uh, how is that different from the Library of Babel? I just throw a, a million random pages of text out on there. I haven't created anything. There will be books there. So I, I think you should be able to copy, if you copy the whole thing with high fidelity, you should come up with your skills still there. But again, that's one of those theory of knowledge things. Do I actually you know, tangibly know how to play the guitar somewhere in the brain that's recorded? And cognitive science is studying that sort of thing, but they're still studing it. We can't be sure. What happens yeah, to do with muscle memory the, too? The concept like, of like, 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 yeah. connections too, yeah. right? To your so, how would that kind of come into play? Then, of course, the question is, where does the brain end? Do you need to copy the stuff on the spinal cord too? Would you need to get all the nerves that are connected throughout your fingers? Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, and when you're tuning that that simulation, you got to make sure you've got all the calluses and things just right because think about how weird it'll be to exactly. wake up in a virtual That's reality simulation, like, reach down and touch crazy. the wood grain. And of course, when you enhance that's it, what, that's what I was, that, was that? It was like uh, you know the wood feels yeah, smooth yeah. to us, but if we peel down, it's not. So you start enhancing. Ex it. Yeah, that's exactly. I think you'd have to copy over the the whole person in order to have tacit knowledge be produced. Mm -hmm. Because again, it's not explicit. It's not made to be portable. That's why it's not a it's a non portable type of knowledge. And I, to make it portable like that, I find it fascinating. By the way, what's really cool is when you touch something. You're not actually even touching something. You're feeling a resistance because of the, the, the of the of the atoms. You're not. What does it mean to actually touch something, right? So we're never actually even feeling anything. So we're just feeling a sensory perception of us trying not to have two things located in the same space, right? But anyways, let's get the safe super chat because yeah. I'm sure we could do this for hours. <laughs> yeah, we could. Fascinating. Uh, actually, I, we're I, gonna I, have to have I, you I, back, uh, uh, Isaac, uh, sometime uh, if you if you would be uh, interested. Uh, hmm? Oh, sure. You, hell, you could become my roommate. This would be we could just have a beer and talk about this stuff all the wow. time. This is great. Okay, so let's get through the super chats here. Zero one three two one three two six six six. Isaac, I'm going to use your mega structure episode to convince flurfers, flat earthers, that NASA built Earth <laughs> is is using your efforts for trolling a problem. Great I question. disapprove of trolling on general principle, but if you really want to do that, not to make any more judgment about choosing to troll them, I would wait till next month when we do the Flat Earth uh, Mega Structures episode because you'll have so much more fun then. But awesome. you shouldn't have fun. Oh, that's that. fantastic. That sounds wonderful. That's awesome. Yeah. That's fantastic. Oh, God. And can we tell uh, them so long and thanks for all the fish? Because, you know. There you go. Yeah. One of my favorite books, actually. Douglas um, Adams. Issa Lycan, $2. Douglas Adams, maybe. You, you love see. that series? Oh, oh Hitchhiker's Guide. Um, him and Terry yeah. Pratchett on the fantasy side of things are two of my favorite authors, just because, and of course, they're dead. Most of my favorite authors are dead now. Uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is one of the original. I, I actually raised on that series. I was actually read to it as a bedtime story. <laughs> so I love it. Oh, it's fantastic. fantastic. Uh, I yeah I love that and um, all mine are dead too Isaac Asimov uh, Ray Bradbury and mm -hmm. Robert Heinlein are some of my favorites but anyways I used to like in uh, two dollars because I love watching Isaac every Thursday Oh, uh, he gave us two dollars so he he loves watching you thank you uh, vibrantly Brantley five dollars how much do you think hormones play a part in personality just how would that work oh that's a good car uh, good question how I mean obviously we were highly influenced by hormones and chemicals so how does that work when you have no physical substrate built upon hormonal mechanisms and pathways um you know again where does the brain end and for that matter where does the body end are your dead skin cells still a part of you is your clothing part of you um we know hormones have a huge effect on people although I shall refrain from giving examples <laughs> they clearly do so you have to emulate that properly 
And again, trying to get a proper emulation is not, and it's one of the reasons why I say you're very unlikely to have artificial intelligence at the human level that was built from the ground up, because you're going to want to take a snapshot, because it's so much easier to take a photograph of a Da Vinci than to actually try to carefully do every dot yourself. <laughs> Good point. Completely. That's a, that's uh, a great, that's, yeah. That's a great example. Uh, totally. Uh, Vibrant again, $5. Some people say people are, some people are born today that they may be the first immortal generation. How likely do you find this claim? Very. Um, actually, that was our last week's episode. I think I said that I, I specifically that I believe that there are people already born today. Who, I, I think in all probability there are people born today who will never die of old age. Not to say they won't die. Well, we're never talking about immortality. We're just talking about uh, extending the life potentially a very long time. When that happened, is it today? Was it yesterday that those first people were born? Or was it hopefully in 1980, which is when I was born, at least according to my birth certificate? I usually like to say 1995. Um, you know, that would be <laughs> my hope that, you know, that people were born in the 70s and 80s who are going to get to see that, that into aging. Um, and of course, it's a process. You get a little bit better at fixing each step, and hopefully, you get there in time. Uh, but maybe if you don't, that's when you start saying, we're making real progress on this. Freeze me and figure out a way to fix me and wake me back up. I do think yeah. there are people alive today who will get to see if anybody's around at all because, you know, we get wiped out. I think if there was a civilization on this planet in the year 3000, there will be people alive who remember today. Yeah, that, and that's, that, that, was the big, that was the big thing for me on whether or not I would do it is that what age would I, you know, would I have the option? Like, I think the, the thir in the 30s, Maybe the 40s me would want to do that, but if I'm up to 80 or you know 90 or whatever, unless they can backtrack me to my 30s, I wouldn't want to be uploaded as a 90 year old, you know, and stay at 90 forever. <laughs> well, no, you would want to be at 90. Yeah, you generate you too. So, um, and see, I'm, I'm just kind of I would think when you're, if you're old, if you're old, why would you care? Your mind's still young. Your body is what gives out, not the brain. I mean, we all. I believe that very strongly. We have this innate. What about dementia? We, we're, we're designed obsolescence, but we have a design. Well, that's that's true. Well, what Stanley could set at any time, just for the fact you're copying. But I be I believe that the body has a designed apps obsolescence because of the Hayflick limit. Your cells can only reproduce themselves. At, what is it? Fifty some odd times, and then you have telomeric shortening. Up so our bodies will not continue. A yeah. hundred is a hundred. You should be able to trip. Um, all uh, somatic cells have that limitation, and it varies from each one. Each one's got mm -hmm. that fuse on it with the uh, the uh, telomeres. Right. Um, but uh, that's just on somatic cells. Obviously, our sperm and ova do not have that limitation, or we wouldn't be around in the first place because it's been many, many generations <laughs> since the dawn of civilization. There are ways to regenerate. We don't want them to do that, though, because every time they copy and it's not quite perfect, there's an increased chance of a copy failure, and we call that cancer. You know? Uh, but, uh, there you go. It's one of those fun things is that many of the things that would actually help us with cancer also increase the other risk there. So it's a copy thing. We are going to get better at that. And, uh, anyone who's interested in the SENS Research Foundation, you know, if they will give you a very detailed knowledge of that. They'll explain it. And when you're done, you're not going to think it's going to happen tomorrow, but you will believe it will happen one day. And in a good way that you'll get to, to enjoy the long life and vigor. And maybe it won't be us. Maybe we will grandkids, but we're getting there. They say every all medicine, all medicine is life extension technology. It's nothing too radical. Crazy. Yeah, and then, and then, by okay, the way, we, we, people that know when you have when you have in the germline um, something when you have telomeric shortening, that's how you get uh, translocation, where you actually end up where you can have different chromosomal numbers. Humans, are, there is a guy in China right now who has forty-four chromosomes. There's a family in Finland that has a whole line of people that have forty-four chromosomes. So you, we are normally sick, uh, 2N46, which is your diploid number, but it is possible to have a different set of, different number of chromosomes. You're still human, by the way, so it has nothing to do with being mm -hmm. human, but it's a fascinating subject. Oh, that's another one of those things we have to sign in the future. Um, vibrant, again. Uh, we, can you say that again because you dropped out? Uh, another one of those ones for concern in the future is how much can you tinker with the human genetically or cybernetically and they're still a human? And of course, I, yeah, that's a, that's a whole different question. <laughs> exactly. That's a whole different question on that mm -hmm. one. Uh, Vibrant, $5. How long should an immortal be imprisoned or if they kill or de delete someone? <laughs> Literally Earth years. Will punishment still be a deterrent? 
So if you want to, if you if you put an immortal in like a like a crystal lattice or something, and their memories are in there, what do you do after a certain time? Just say, hey, you you've spent you know almost an eternity in here. It's time to delete you. How does that work? I don't even know. Um, where to begin. I was thinking of in a lot of sci-fi where they freeze the person and they wake them up like the, you know forty years later as punishment for their crime. I never really was quite clear on how that works. I I would not want. Yeah, I mean I would find it a punishment because I'd miss my no, friends and family. A lot of motors probably would not. <laughs> it's a very subjective yeah. punishment. It's either the worst torture ever or a favor. People would pay money to do that. In cases. Um, if you know, it's all about do you prescribe to which theory of justice? And of course, most of us we we don't look at it as a single one being right. Rehabilitation versus punishment versus just separating you out for protection. The idea is kind of to, to fuse it based on what the crime is, what the person is, and what your what your limitations are. And I mean, if you're in a very desperate situation, like a, a, a post-apocalyptic or if you start having to execute people again because you can't imprison them, you just don't have the resources for it. Uh, alternatively, in a, a wealthier society, you can have to get away with rehabilitation. And I think most of us tend to prefer that way we can. Um, but even then, you know, the question is not so much what can you do, how long would you imprison someone, but what's your goal? What is your goal with doing this? I don't know that locking someone up for a million years is because they killed someone is really going to have achieved anything when you can just as easily, because they're digital, flip a switch that makes us they never kill anyone again. And, uh, yeah, and you know, that, do, that do you think? You might have. Yeah. Do you, I, do you think we have the tech? We have too much super chats, and I'm going to throw it back to Kyle. Do you think that we have the technology now? If I wanted to say, hey, I want to be thrown 10,000 years in the future. By using some kind of time dilation, whether it be gravimetric or be um, due to Lorentz factors, <laughs> going to the speed of light, eventually that's going to happen. Eventually, that technology um, is I mean, just no. inevitable, I think. But how close do you think we are? If we had to do it in an emergency situation, it was like we got to send this person ten thousand years in the future. Could we have the technology right now? You think to do that? We could freeze right enough now. money at it, and uh, the, 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 no, the no, technology no, no, not, even not, not, not freezing. Oh, you mean? But I mean, literally. Do it by by physics by using special relativity or general oh, relativity. God. Not right now. Uh, I mean, uh, ten thousand years. Even if we assumed that we could let them live for a decade, like they you know, just a relative physics of time, they experienced ten years while ten thousand passed. That's a a, a balance of a thousand. Was that like ninety nine point nine nine nine? I mean, that you yeah, know, well, a thousand. Yeah. That's a thousand mass. Let's assume, let's assume, you get, um, let's assume you get a I, factor of ninety nine point nine 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 nine. So you just one day is ten thousand years. Just you know, so if you're gonna, you don't, you don't think. Okay, how much do you think we'd have to accelerate before you would even be able to do that? Twenty percent. Well, I'd have to walk it out it, on the I, on the actual scratch pad to do it. It'd take me a while. It'd be fascinating I mean, to you do that, though. Like, well, there's calculators online that have that that too. But I mean, you know, you can only accelerate people so fast. It takes a year to get up to light speed without even factoring in the relativistic part. So you know takes about a year to get that half time dilation. So you're going to experience many months uh, coming and going down even before you start getting to that really high factor. And you're going to have to keep accelerating that whole time. And you won't be able to do it anyway because you're going to start getting drag in space. Space is not a vacuum. You start getting up to like Lorenz's of 10 or 100, it's like AO at that point. <laughs> you know? <laughs> you oh, got yeah. your streamline, Absolutely. you got drag. It's very difficult. Where you get, yeah. um, and, I, I mean, uh, let me get through this two last get. super chat. Close to twenty percent, maybe I think. Yeah, we'll we'll have to figure it out. But it's 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 a fascinating discussion on that of what, what how fast we could actually get with modern technology. But anyways, two more super chats. Uh, uh Serbia, five dollars. Can I choose to have a flavory taste of a Hana tuna be uploaded so I can enjoy it in the form of a floppy disk in the future? That'd be an incorrigible type belief. It's called um, if you like uh, this particular taste. It's an incorrigible belief, and that is subjective, but I think he's already pointed out that if you map the brain exactly the way it it is for the individual, you would have everything, including tacit knowledge and things like that, uh, experiential knowledge and subjective knowledge be transferred over in, in the same way, would you not? Mm -hmm. Yeah, again, that, that is assuming that your brain, you know, wherever we're going to define the brain as ending, because it might have to include all your neural endings too. If it's mapped, and again, never perfectly, but with high enough fidelity, incompleteness, and emulate it accordingly, because again, you got to emulate it just right. 
then you should be able to still do those things. And of course, you could just experience that. We'll see that before brain uploading, though, because we will, people will want to be able to taste things and feel textures and virtual realities. And so that, you know, even if we start getting into mind uploading, they should be trying to find a way to stimulate those. Uh, you know, so you can't have a piece yeah, of absolutely. pie in virtual reality and taste it, you know? <laughs> and and I agree with you. And last but not least, is Sandring, thank you for fifty dollars super chat. Thank you, Sandring, very much. Um, he says, "I think I'm going to start putting random Latin phrases in these, so you'll have no idea what I'm saying, and you'll try to find a translation. Hmm, maybe Klingon. Um, good luck. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I like it. Good luck. Do, do it. it. Do it. Make it happen. Yeah. Uh, um, um, so I don't know. Any, do you know any Klingon, Kyle? I'm, I don't even I, know I where that's from." <laughs> <laughs> um i know grog is it grog grog what is it there, there's a button i i, I think speak of, i could i'm sure i could think of a few words out of it but i no i've never learned how to speak klingon i don't know how to speak uh elvin from uh lord of rings i don't not my particular flavor of geekdom uh I, although i would not criticize that because i am certainly my own type of geek in the extreme so <laughs> whatever makes yeah uh, whatever i think time go by i remember i, I remember I they, they had gawk which was like the Remember the squirmy little eels that they ate? They called it. Oh, gawk. yes. Yeah. I remember that's that really close to me. I remember out. that. Back in the old days when the television was a three dimensional object, <laughs> the radiation king. Uh, a lot of those shows yeah. don't hold up so well when you can see them in high resolution nowadays. I remember Babylon 5. I love yeah. the special effects that you have. Uh, that is true. You can see this. It's a, it's a, I watched a the downside. Series. And the movie. A lot of people's uh, Anyways, this, this is bad to say. Uh, this is horrible to say, but uh, some people's faces don't hold up to HD. There was an uh, we had a news anchor from where I lived that um, on standard definition, uh, he looked you know just normal middle aged man. But when we switched over, I remember distinctly when we switched over to HD, you could see like every line in his. I mean, it just it, it was like a. I was like, switch back over to SD. Go back over to SD. Um, so yeah. I know that's hard to to uh, bad of me to say, but um, but uh, Arthur, thank you very much for for coming on and talking with us. This was fascinating, and we would love to have you back. And I'm gonna let you let, let everybody know where they can find you, uh, social media, follow you, uh, Facebook, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, I was very glad to be on. It's been a, a very great conversation that I enjoyed. So I'd be glad to pick it up again sometime down the road. And uh, if you're interested in more topics, uh. Swing by Science and Futurism with Isaac Arthur. Uh, it's pretty easy to Google up on Facebook or YouTube. And uh, we've got, I think, 160 episodes now. So plenty of material to keep you going. And uh, we're always glad to have people by for discussion on the Facebook page. Absolutely. And uh, you can find that link to uh, his channel in the description. Go check it out. You won't be sorry. Um, every, episode, every episode that he's got, you can just look at the titles and tell that they're fascinating. I mean, he just covers a wide range of stuff that um, you'll learn something in each one, I guarantee you. So um, go over there and, and watch that as soon as we're done here. Or um, actually, you can follow. Uh, I'll also be going on to a Sirius the Skeptics channel right after this. Um, I'm actually getting ready to go over there right now uh, for his uh, Hammer Time podcast, where we're going to be talking about uh, how we, when we have the shows that are contentious and the, the debates that are really, you know, the, there's passionate people on both sides. How do you strike a... a you know, a middle ground with them and keep them from just killing each other. Sometimes you don't, as you've seen from some of the shows that we've had here, but um, we're going to dive into w what it takes to kind of piece these personalities together sometimes. And um, if you're interested in that, hop over to his channel and um, we'll see you back here tomorrow at eight o'clock for Martimer 81. I know some people are excited about that too. So uh, we're going to be talking about fallacies tomorrow so steve uh big week for you steve big big philosophy a lot of philosophy minds this week big week yes, and a sandring for another 50 dollars. he's being very generous today thank you a sandring oh that's, wow that's another super oh, chat wow. yeah thank you sandring um he says so f um or f he's i i think this so future is going to be like the book altered carbon lovely i've not read that book i don't know who even wrote it um i'm not familiar with it so um, uh, richard are you familiar with it it, it, is yeah, it good to have the future like that or not? Oh, that not thing? the one painted in that book. It's, uh, yeah, <laughs> it's a great book. Uh, it's a great book. I recommend everybody read it at some point, but uh, I would hope the future does not turn out that way. <laughs> yeah, and, and vibrantly says, 
Pineapple on pizza. Pineapple, pineapple on pizza. No, it is an objective no. fact that pineapple does not belong on pizza. It is written Correct. into the fabric of the universe. Don't Correct. do it. It's just an abomination. It'll it'll ruin Correct. your mortal soul. Um, All right, everyone. So, and um, one more, one more. Brainery says, "Awesome okay. show today, guys." Encore. We'll have him back. Trust me. We agree. Thank yes, this was fantastic. Um, it, the uh, I'm so glad that you guys suggested that he come on. So um, that was a that's the best the best suggestion yet to date. This is the uh, this is the one. So we appreciate it, and um, thank you guys for watching. We'll see you back here tomorrow at 8 p.m. And um, until then, have a good evening.